Good day, this is Jim Pytel from Columbia Gorge Community College Renewable Energy Technology Program. This is RIT 120 Hydraulics. Today, we're gonna to have a further in detailed discussion about series and parallel hydraulic circuits. And I actually really like this lecture because not only does it serve as a chance to illustrate the concepts unique to series and parallel hydraulic circuits, it also gives us a chance to practice our force, pressure, and area relationships. Because again, I cannot emphasize this enough. Um, this takes practice, and it takes you sitting down and playing with some numbers. Um, you can't buy this, gotta earn it, okay? So let's go ahead and earn it while we talk about series and parallel hydraulic circuits. So our first arrangement here is a series circuit, series hydraulic circuit. How do I know it's a series circuit? Well, basically, one cylinder's outflow is another cylinder's inflow, okay? And just like you've learned in electronics, the resistor one, resistor two, conventional current flow is going through resistor one and then through resistor two. And if you wanna use that analogy, go ahead and use that for this here. Basically, cylinder A, cylinder B, as pressurized flow enters the cap end of cylinder A, and that piston face starts to move, that's the only time the fluid inside the rod end starts moving. And because it's connected to this passageway right here, that's the only time cylinder B's cap end starts moving. And by extension, that's the only time, i.e. simultaneously, when cylinder B's rod end starts pushing fluid out of this rod end port. Okay, so that just serves to illustrate the fact that basically a series arrangement it's a simultaneous extension, okay? But there's some pretty neat things about this here that occur. And one of them is the extension of B. The amount of its extension is dependent on what A is pushing out. And that makes perfect sense from our drawing right here because this volume of fluid inside A's rod end is going into B's cap end. And because of the existence of the rod inside A, even if they were simul even, even if they were perfectly identical cylinders, because of the existence of the rod in the rod end, it's taking away the amount of volume in A. So that means there's less fluid to fill up B. And that's again, if they're identical cylinders. So let's go ahead and actually put some numbers here to this so we can start talking about it. Let's pretend we've got two identical cylinders. They've got a cap and it's got a one inch diameter, a rod that's got a five eighths inch diameter. I've got a travel length of six inches. Okay, so what's our cap area? So, pi over four, d squared, 0.8754 inches squared. So now just the area of the rod, not the annulus area, I'm talking about just the rod, pi over four, five eighths squared, is gonna give us an area of 0.3068 inches squared. Now the functional area, basically the rod face area, the donut, if you will, that is going to be the cap area minus the rod, 0.4786 inches square. 
Okay, so now, what is the volume in the fluid of the cap end at full extension, i.e., all this fluid here when it's fully extended? Well, it's this area times 6, 4.712 cubic inches. Rod end volume, when it's fully retracted, think of that 5 8 inch rod is now taking up space with inside that previous cubic area of 0.4712. What is the area of that rod? Well, it's 0.368 times 6. That value, we're going to have to subtract it from our cap volume. Additionally, you could also just take the rod face area, 0.478, and multiply it times its travel length of 6. And either way, you're going to come up with the same answer, 2.872 cubic inches. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and clean this up so we can continue. Okay, and then we go ahead and hook our cylinders up, and then we go ahead and I'm going to clean this up too. Pressurized flow enters the cap end port of A, and the rod starts extending. That volume right there is critical. That volume is 2.872 inches. But again, they're identical cylinders. So for this to fully extend, the cap end of B, for that to fully extend, it requires 4.712 cubic inches. Okay? So for it to fully extend 6 inches. Okay? So when 0.2, excuse me, 2.872 cubic inches is put into a space that can fit up to 4.712 inches, of what portion is that filled? Well, it's 2.872 inches of a possible 4.712 inches. And if you do the math, 2.872 divided by 4.712, it's basically roughly 60. 0.95% full, you know, and if all the way full was 6 inches, how, would, how, how much is 60% full? It will have extended, it will have filled up an area of 3.657 inches. Basically meaning that cylinder B is only going to extend 3.657 inches. There's a bunch of different ways to do this thing too, but I find this kind of this ratio method is the simplest way of thinking about it. And again, you're just thinking about volumes. The volume of A's rod end, and again, these are identical cylinders, is smaller than the cap end of B. Therefore, that same volume of fluid is being transferred from the rod end of A to the cap end of B, and it will only fill up a portion of B. Therefore, B will only partially extend, in our particular example, it extends 3.657 inches. Okay, So they extended simultaneously, and cylinder A extends all the way. Cylinder B only extends a portion of the way. Okay, Simultaneous extension partial extension for cylinders downstream, okay? And again, this is for identical cylinders. Now, let's go ahead and not complicate, but make this more interesting. So we ran into a problem here. Cylinder B, well, it's not a problem. You might only require 3.657 inches of lift. What happens now if cylinder A was larger. Still got the same rod, still got the same travel. What changes? Well, 
the area in the cap, the area of the rod, and by extension, the rod face area, cap volume, and rod volume. Okay, again, cylinder A, we're going to increase the size of cylinder A. Cylinder B is still this guy. Okay, so let's go ahead and do the numbers, and I'm just going to go ahead and write them in there. Do it yourself. Just do what we did. Go ahead and pause the tape, figure out the area, the rod area, the rod face area, the cap volume, and rod volume, uh, rod end volume for, I should say end, for our new cylinder, our new and improved larger cylinders. Go ahead and figure that out right now, and we'll be here waiting for you. Okay, you're back from your calculations, and if you've done everything correctly, the area on the cap should have 1.67 inches squared. Rod air is still the same thing, because we haven't changed the size of the rod. But the rod area face, because we're dealing with a larger cap area, we're going to have a larger area there. Basically, the functional area, the annulus, the ring, 1.46 inches squared. So the cap end volume, 10.6 cubic inches. Rod end volume, 8.76 cubic inches. So now we've got super cylinder A. hooked up in a series arrangement with cylinder B. Will they extend simultaneously? Yes, they will, because A and B, again, pressurized flow. To move this thing, to pushes on the cap end face, means it pushes on the rod end face, which, because of this passageway, pushes on the cap and face of B. So it's a simultaneous extension. Will B extend all the way? Yes, it will. Because now, what is the cap end volume here? 4.712 cubic inches. Is there enough space in the rod end of B? Yes, there is. 8.76 cubic inches. Cylinder B, no problem. It's going to fully extend. And it's going to push fluid out of there, out of its rod end. But now, will cylinder A extend all the way? What happens here? Just, just think about this. What happens here? Here is our big bazooka cylinder. Here's cylinder B. And it's fully extended. It's the limits of travel, meaning 4.712 cubic inches. I mean, think about what's happening here. 4.712 cubic inches is inside here of a possible 8.71, oh, excuse me, 8.76. How much is still inside the rod end? of A. Well, it's 8.76 minus 4.712. So it's basically there still remains 4.048 cubic inches. Okay? So what I'm saying is you can get this cylinder B to fully extend in this um, relationship where you got an extremely large cylinder, well, not extremely large, but a larger cylinder. Um, downstream of B. But again, we've kind of overshot our mark here because now cylinder A will not fully extend because basically, again, what happens at cylinder B? There's, there's nowhere for this fluid to go. There's no path. Basically, that cylinder has reached the limits of a travel. There is no passageway. from this side of the cylinder to, from the cap end, to the rod end. There's no, no passageway unless a seal breaks, which we'll talk about the seals. There's seals on the side of a cylinder here on the piston face. You know, conceptually, one of those seals could blow, but yeah, we're working in a perfect world where nothing fails. There's no passageway from the cap end to the rod end, and again, fluid flow stops. It's an incompressible median. Therefore, this thing will not fully, ex 
fully extend. Cylinder A in our example, our second example, will not fully extend. Okay, so the point of the story is, is basically if you want simultaneous extension, use a series cylinder arrangement. If you want a simultaneous extension and you want both cylinders to fully extend to the limits of the travel, you have got to start playing around with cylinder sizes. And the, the solution is this volume here of cylinder A, rod end volume, has got to be equal to the cap end volume of cylinder B. Okay, that's kind of the solution there. Basically, as long as this thing is the same as this volume here, both cylinders will simultaneously extend and extend the limits of the travel. Depends on your application. You might be totally fine with cylinder B not fully extending, or you might be totally fine with cylinder A not fully extending. But if you want them to fully extend to the, both the limits of the travel, the rod end volume of A has got to be equal to the cap end volume of B. And for our example, let's say cylinder B was our one inch one, so that volume right there, oops, excuse me, 4.712 cubic inches. We gotta make sure that our upstream cylinder has a rod end volume of 4.712 cubic inches. And let's say we still want both of them to simultaneously extend six inches. So 4.712 cubic inches So what is this area of the ring? 4.712, basically that area, 0.7854 inches squared. But again, we got to subtract that rod in there. Ultimately, what I'm saying is got to make sure that that rod has got 0.78, excuse me, the rod end face has an area of 0.7854 cubic inches. So you're going to have to increase the size of A ever so slightly. Let's say, we're, let's say we are still at a 5 eighths inch rod. So that volume, 0.7854 plus 0 0.3068. The, the diameter of that cylinder has to be 1.065 inches in area, inches squared. OK? Because a cylinder with an area of 1.065 inches squared minus a rod of 0 0.3068 is equal to an area of 0.7854 inches squared. What is the diameter that will give us a value, an area? Pi over 4 d squared. We're going to solve for d in this particular case, 1.065 pi over 4 d squared 4 pi square root square root our answer is so our diameter should be 1.164 inches squared so what is 164 inches squared it's roughly 1 and 5 30 seconds of an inch, are you going to find a cell? And it, that's that's so. That's the closest thing you could fit it into for um for fractions of an inch. Are you going to find something uh that close? No, you're not. Um, basically, just go one size up or one size down, whichever fits your emission close enough. And again, so let's 
let's just think about this. Okay, you really did find a cylinder, one and five thirty seconds inch diameter. So what's the area? Area is equal to should be pi over four. One whoops. One five thirty seconds squared. One point oh five inches squared. What's that volume if it's to travel six inches? Actually, we don't need to do that. Sorry. What we need to calculate is this volume when there is a rod in there of 5 eighths inch diameter. So what is this area? It's 1.05 minus 0 0.3068, which is 0 0.7432 inches squared. What's the volume of this rod end of A? Because again, what we're trying to strive for is the volume of rod A has got to be equal to rod end A, cap end B. So 0 0.7432 times 6, 4.459 cubic inches. What is the volume necessary for that? I think we had 4.712, 4.712 cubic inches. So close enough. Basically, the volume from rod end A has got to be equal to the cap end of B if we want them to simultaneously extend. And how we did that, we just slightly upsized cylinder A. Um, you know, you might get better results rather than 5.30 seconds to 6.30 seconds. So again, if you're dealing with fractions of an inch, you've only got a certain value. Do they sell one 5.30 seconds? I don't know. You might find it. Okay? So, um, Another application, too, um, of series cylinders. What happens if I did this? Pretty neat, huh? Think about a move uh, movement that needs to be translated left and right along a linear path. Pressure enters, pressurized flow enters cap end of A, pushes this forward. Basically, fluid enters rod end of B. So, coming out of rod end A into rod end of B, retracting B, okay, and moving our load this way. Now, you have a directional control valve that. Pressurized flow enters cap end of B, pushes out fluid from rod end B into rod end of A, retracting A. Flow exits cap end A, and our load is pushed that way. And what's neat about this here, just use exactly identical cylinders. Because again, what was the point of that huge long exercise that I just got there is Rod end volume out equals cap end end. We are very lucky in the fact that if they're identical cylinders, they should have identical rod end volumes for an application like this. Okay, so we've talked about simultaneous extension. We've also talked about limits of extension. You got to size these things appropriately. There's something in here that we have not discussed, and that is very critical to a series cylinder circuit. It's called pressure intensification. Okay, let's take our, our plain old vanilla series circuit and actually throw some numbers in it. Okay, so here is our simple uh, series circuit here, and again, we're going to use a 
cap end, they're both identical cylinders A and B. And let's say we're totally cool with uh, B only partially extending. Don't worry about it, no problem. Um, cap end, one inch, five eighths inch rod, traveling six inches. Again, what's our cap area? Area is equal to pi over four, D squared. We're going to get 0.7854. And again, just keep doing, doing these by yourself to get some more practice. 0.3068. 0.4786. Okay, let's say we've got a load, and load is attached to cylinder A. It's a 400-pound load that we're going to push across some path. What is the pressure requirement for this cylinder system? Well, since A is the one that's doing the lifting, basically, Directional control valve is put in a position where pressurized flow enters cap end of A. Pressure is transmitted through there to the cap end face with an area of 0.7854, and force is developed as this is pushed out. And again, pressurized flow, let's say it's just started, it's 100 psi, 200 psi, 300 psi. At a certain point, it's the force available is going to overcome our 400 pounds of resistance and it's going to lift. What is that force? Well, oh, excuse me, what is that force? What is that pressure? F P A relationship. We're solving for pressure. Pressure is equal to force divided by area. It's a 400 pounds of resistance on an area 0.7854. At 509 PSI, pounds per square inch, don't forget units, that load will start to move. Okay, now you may think that this is going to be the maximum pressure at 509 PSI. I can set my pressure relief valve to 600 PSI. Let's say, you, let's say you're thinking about, okay, what's the minimum I can get the pressure relief valve to uh, go, you know, obviously above 509 PSI. And you're like, hey, I'll just give it a little bit more just to make sure it moves 600 PSI. And you say, tell your boss, you say, okay, the maximum say, maximum working pressure in this system is 600 PSI. So let's get hoses that are capable of standing a pressure of 600 PSI. And as soon as you use this system, a hose breaks. And here's why. What's the pressure here? Well, it's got 400 pounds of force on this area. Okay? Because if the piston face is moving and it's capable of lifting 400 pounds, it's also pushing 400 pounds of force on that area, an area of 0.4786 inches squared. Same force, smaller area, increased pressure. OK? So what's the pressure here, pressure downstream? Still, pressure equals force times area, 400, 0.4786. Eight hundred thirty six to round up PSI. Pressure intensification has occurred because it's a smaller area. Same force, smaller area because that rod end face has a portion where the rod used to be removed. Okay, so this is a neat concept to illustrate here. Basically, pressure intensification in a circuit can occur in a series relationship outside of the control of the pressure relief valve. Because remember, pressure relief valve is, here's our hoses, here's our directional control valves, whatever we got hooked up to it. Here's our pump tank. Here's a pressure relief valve right there. You set it to 600 PSI. You should be able to lift it, no problem. But again, where is higher pressure occurring? It's 
occurring right there on the order of 836 psi. Okay, so pressure intensification is occurring in a series relationship. Um, this is also known as an intensifier. And again, pressure intensification, intensifier. And an intensifier is a device that its sole purpose in life is to use a larger area, uh, apply a force to a larger area. And that force is then in turn applied to a smaller area, thereby increasing the pressure. Okay, so let's go ahead and illustrate an example of that. So here's a uh, simple single stroke uh, intensifier, um, also known as a booster. Um, basically, you've got a large diameter piston face, and here is low, well, not low pressure relatively low pressure, uh, low pressure, large amount, i.e. high flow um, fluid there, pressurized fluid, acting on an area, and say for our example, it's a four inch area, four inch squared area, and that large piston is connected via a rod to a smaller piston. And let's say for our example, it's a two inch square area. So 1,000 PSI is applied to an area of 4 inches squared, thereby this force is 4,000 pounds of force is now transferred to our piston of 2 inches squared. So 4,000 pounds, again, Four thousand divided by two inches squared, two thousand pounds per square inch or psi. So we've taken low pressure, higher flow to higher pressure, doubled it to low flow because it's a smaller volume right there. Okay, um, they basically applying a system, uh, you know, small pressure to a larger area, and that force is then transferred to the smaller piston. Okay, um, schematic symbol for something like that, you might see these. If this is a cylinder, typical double acting cylinder. Here's my inlet port. Here's my outlet port. So, so it's kind of like a cylinder. It's like a modified version, the schematic cylinder, uh, the schematic of a double acting cylinder. That's intensifier. OK, so again, this is our small volume, high pressure. Here's our low pressure inlet, high volume. Again, this is the rod he used to transfer that force between those sides. Uh, there's such a thing as called as a reciprocating intensifier. And um, you know, the single stroke intensifier, the problem with this is basically you just get a single stroke. A reciprocating intensifier is these guys back to back. You know, so you can um you're getting a constant flow rate, okay? All right, so let's uh, let's talk about our oh another critical relationship, our parallel hydraulic circuits. So go ahead, I'm going to go ahead and draw a parallel circuit, and we'll talk about that. But before we do that, let's summarize our series um, main characteristics again: series hydraulic circuits, simultaneous extension, pressure intensification. We have to match the outlet of cylinder A to the inlet of cylinder B if we want full extension. And then one last caveat here. What happens here? This cylinder is, cylinder B, is kinked or jammed. 
and it's stuck. Can't move. Will anybody move? There's cylinder A and B. And the answer is no. It requires all cylinders to move if it if any of them are to move. Okay, because again, pressurized flow enters here, it's gonna push fluid out, and it's gonna push fluid in. And if that thing can't move, this means fluid can't come out, which means fluid can't come in. Okay. So these are also used, you know, a, you know, this is a straight up intensifier using cylinders in series, often used in areas where space is at a premium. You know, for example, here is two cylinders hooked in series, and they're producing. Let's say that was our 509 PSI right there, and that was our 835 or 836 PSI right there. We were capable of lifting 400 pounds on cylinder A from this example. What are we capable of lifting there? Well, 836 PSI times point, uh, force pressure divided by area. So our pressure, 836 divided by 0.7854, capable of lifting 1,064 pounds. Granted, we're only capable of moving it even when cylinder A fully extends, extends 3.6 inches, something like that. Was our value? Uh, I erased it. Let's pretend it was 3.6 inches. You know, you're still capable of lifting a greater weight of 1,064 pounds. And now that's with two one-inch cylinders hooked in series. You know, to lift 1,064 pounds at 509 psi with a single cylinder, you'd have to have a larger barrel diameter. I have made a fatal flaw, guys. I'm sorry. I knew my numbers were acting weird there. Okay, let's do this again. 509 PSI is applied to the cap of cylinder A. As a result, we get um, 836 PSI on this end, so 836 force pressure divided Oops, that was what my problem was. It's right here. Don't, don't do that, guys. Cannot believe I just did that. P times A. Oh yeah, yeah. Eight thirty-six times point seven eight five four. Six hundred fifty-five pounds. For 655 pounds, 656 pounds of force. Granted, I'm only capable of lifting it 3.56 inches, whatever it was, but I'm capable of producing a larger amount of force at a smaller input pressure, 509 psi. And now the reason why this is critical is because let's say I had to use 509 PSI, and I wanted to lift 656 pounds, 509 PSI, what would be the area required to do that? So I'm not going to make that mistake this time. F, P, A, force divided by pressure, 656 divided by 509. It's an area of 1.29 inches squared, basically saying that we need a larger cylinder than our one inch diameter. Because we were previously a one inch diameter, which had an area of 7.7854. We need a cylinder with a 1.29 inch squared area. Let's say we couldn't fit a cylinder that big in there. Well, 
use a series relationship. Because of pressure intensification, then two cylinders were capable of lifting or producing more force with a smaller cylinder. Okay? All right, let us go to parallel. I cannot believe I did that. So remember that, guys. Draw the triangle. Don't just go crazy. All right, let's talk about parallel circuits. Okay, so here is a parallel relationship. And parallel hydraulic circuits, they differ from series in the fact that cylinders share the same inflow path, i.e., pressure right there. They also share the same outflow path. So as pressurized flow enters the cap end of both these cylinders, and again, let's pretend it is a totally identical cylinder, totally identically loaded. They all have the same frictional drag in them. They are going to extend simultaneously. But it's not a perfect world, so we are going to go ahead and see how these things behave. Okay, let's pretend this guy is loaded with 400 pounds. This guy is loaded with 800 pounds. And again, we are cap, one inch rod, five eighths of an inch, travel line, six inches, area, 0.7854, rod, 0.3068, the ring, 0.4, what was it, 48, 4786. What's the pressure requirement to lift 400 pounds? Given an area of 0.7854 should be 509 psi. What's the pressure requirement to lift 800 pounds? So that's A, that's B. 800, same area, 0.7854 five four should be 1019 psi okay so now pressurized flow enters both cap end ports and pressure rises because there's nowhere to go until it rises to 509 psi at which point cylinder a can extend and lift our 400 pound weight And then, I actually drew that, drew that a little, because it doesn't pass the rod end port. At which point it becomes a confined fluid again because we've reached limits of our travel. And then pressure rises to 600 psi, 700 psi, 800, 900, up to 1019 psi. And then, cylinder B extends. Okay, So will they extend fully? Yes. Um, what if they're different sizes? Doesn't matter. You know, they're going to extend their, their inflow paths are the same, but the they're independent of each other. They're not dependent upon one filling up the other. Let's say, for example, our last example with our series circuit there, where one cylinder was bound up. Cylinder A is kinked, it's bound up, it's not going to move anywhere. What happens here with cylinder B? Well, this is a confined space. There's no way that fluid can flow. The pressure is just going to increase, increase. No flow is going to occur. But here is a space where you can move. This cylinder can still move. And once it reaches the pressure requirement to lift the load on B, it's going to lift load B regardless of the fact that cylinder A is bound up, okay? Um, 
Let's consider another example. Here's two equally loaded cylinders. 400 PSI in a parallel relationship. But cylinder B is bigger. Which one will extend first? Okay. You don't even really need to do any numbers on this. Let's say if it's one inch, inch and a half, you don't even really need to do any numbers, but you always have that at your disposal to do this. Pretty obviously, cylinder B is going to extend first. The reason why is there is less pressure requirement. It's the same load, it's the same force, but think about it, there's a bigger area, okay? So we already figured out that it takes 509 PSI to lift a um, 400 pound load with a one inch cylinder. What does it take to lift 400 pounds with an inch and a half diameter cylinder? So the area for an inch and a half, a pi over four, 1.5 squared, 1.767 inches squared, Force is still the same, divided by our area. Still the same at 400 pounds. Area 1.76 inches squared. Our pressure requirement, 226 PSI. Okay, same load, bigger area, thereby 226 pounds per square inch acting on an area. 1.767 inches squared will produce a force of 400 pounds. Don't believe me? 226 times 1.76, because again, force is equal to pressure times area. I'm never going to make that mistake again. Just to make sure, 226 times 1.767, 399.8 close enough to 400 pounds. Okay, so parallel circuits, series circuits, just different ways of hooking these things up. And we're going to go ahead and actually play around with these in lab and uh, see if they're actually going to really demonstrate all the concepts we talk about. Pressure and intensification in a terms of a series circuit, um, simultaneous extension for a series circuit, um, the fact that the cylinder with the lowest pressure requirement will extend first in a parallel circuit. Some pretty neat stuff, okay?